Welcome into the DNVR Rockies podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Now new customers, when you use the code DNVR, you can go ahead and make a $5 bet on any NBA money line. And guess what? You're going to get $200 in free bet if your team wins. That's code DNVR only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. I am your host, Patrick Lyons. And joining me today in the midst of a little bit of a lull between the end of the league championship series and the start of the world series is one of my favorite people to talk baseball with. And, and we're going to talk Rockies and we're going to talk prospects. We'll dip into the world series. We'll do all of that and more because that's what, that's what Mr. Justin Wick brings to the table and more. Justin Wick, welcome to the show. Welcome back. I should say my guy. I mean, honestly, I am flattered to be a returning guest right here. I mean, always a privilege with the DNVR crew and seriously, thank you for having me. Yeah, I always, uh, always love chopping it up with you. I, I can't be with you uh, this autumn, unfortunately not. But we had our time uh, down in the Arizona Fall League. That's where you're at today, scouting the guys. You're you're pulling double duty, as you, you always like to do. You're a good multitasker. You're down there in the Arizona Fall League. and I, So I thought now's probably the perfect time to discuss all things Arizona Fall League. For anyone that doesn't know already, how can you summarize what the AFL is in, in a nutshell? Man, well, I mean, my bias is going to shine through, and I'm going to say it's the greatest thing ever, first and foremost. <laughs> but no, it's a lot. It's it is incredibly fun down here. The Arizona Fall League it serves as, I suppose, if you want to consider it, the top graduate school of a lot of different minor league prospects. This is it's technically not minor league baseball, but it is taking the best minor league prospects that you are going to see in the fold, and it's really putting them in a showcase type of setting where. You, know, you put them in some of these gorgeous spring training venues. You start putting it into perspective of these guys are about one or two years out of being in the big leagues. And it's checking to see, you know, how ready are these guys? Are they ready to potentially skip a level? Are they moving up the ranks? Are they showcasing their stuff to where, you know, is this going to be somebody that's expedited to the big leagues? And, of course, with the Rockies, that's what we're seeing at this point. So, Patrick, I know you know this all too well, but for any of the listeners, there are six teams in the Arizona Fall League. They have hand-selected six of the finest spring training ballparks that you're going to see in Arizona. And for all six fall league teams, every team has five different MLB affiliates. So you'll see the Salt River Rafters with the Rockies and Diamondbacks NL West rivalry wearing the same exact uniforms. <laughs> but it's very fun to be able to piece this together. You'll see, I mean, any given fall league game, you're going to see 10 different MLB jerseys out on the field. So it's pretty much an all-star game every single day down here. And it's one of the more intimate environments that you're going to see the stars of tomorrow. And that's what I always lean on. That's what I always tell people. So in the meantime, you'll probably see me at any other game. So, I mean, that's always a good sign, I suppose. But it's been an absolute blast. And it's, I mean, this is my second year with the league at this point. And I joke around saying I could do it for the next 50 if they wanted to keep me around. But we've been having a blast. Yeah, being able to, to experience it last year for the first time, it was very much a a dream come true. It's it's like you want to go to spring training and check off all of those boxes and, and do those kind of things. But I think the Arizona Fall League is an extension of that, of of being able to see the top guys. It's a finishing school. As you said, graduate school, it's that that last stop really to really test a player's medal. Uh and and see if, you know, for for a lot of these guys, they have an opportunity to be placed on the 40 man roster this fall. And this this is maybe an opportunity uh to turn some more heads uh, and figure out uh, if this guy is somebody that you want to protect, leave him available for the Rule 5 draft, whatever it may be. And uh, it's it's just a, a, an amazing atmosphere. And so many you know great players have come through there. Um, you know, Mike Trout, Bryce Harper, all the, anyone, anyone you can think of has come through the Arizona Fall League. And as you said, you know, they have uh, six of the best facilities down in spring training there. So, I mean, you can go to a game every, every single day. I think you can even get like a season ticket pass for like a hundred bucks. I, hopefully I, I didn't undercut it, but it's really affordable. It's great for families and stuff to go to. And the thing that I love most uh, about the AFL, what they, do, uh, they do every single year is they really keep upping the bar. And this year, uh, I would love to hear what it was like when you guys up the bar to the chase field, triple header, instead of just using those spring training facilities, which are great, including the one you're at right now. And, uh, in Glendale Camelback ranch and salt, uh, river fields is, is the top hands down, but being able to play in a big league ballpark like Chase Field, what was that experience like for, for you and, and the uh, you know Arizona Fall League communications team uh, and for the players as well? 
Sure. You know, it was, I remember when we first put it in writing that we were going to do this back in the spring, when you started to realize that, I mean, the contractual negotiations that go into it, it was a whirlwind, but all of a sudden, you know, they had me design the scoreboard graphics and send it over to the Chase Field crew. And I was like, this is starting to get real in a hurry at this point. So it was, I know this was something kind of in a long time type of discussion. Give this, we wanted to treat this as a training ground, just as it always is. But what is it that we can kind of give back to the players to really reward them and say, you know, this is something that, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel is inevitably you being a big leaguer at this point. We've got this gorgeous venue that we can utilize. So it was, I think the most gratifying part of that entire day was seeing all 16 teams come off the bus at their respective game times and seeing everybody with their phones out taken. We had just because these people really were, were like fired up to do this. So this was, that was a special moment and it really helped put things into perspective that, you know, it's really cool. And you maybe perhaps don't see that so much in a big league setting every single day because, you know, it's so constant and it's almost normal for these guys, but it was pretty real when you realized that it wasn't normal for these guys to be able to play in that venue, even though in a year or two, many of them are going to be there anyways. So it was, it took a while. It was an adventure to really process. It was, you know, a long day when we're talking 20, it was 22 innings because we had an extra inning and we played seven innings, but it was a long day. It was a lot of fun. It was, it didn't seem like a long day when we were at the end of it because there were so many people that were just so excited to really make it happen. And it really felt like, you know, we're building something special down here when we're able to take advantage of those opportunities. So on top of it too, I know we had the Phoenix Municipal Stadium triple header that we also did this past Saturday. So that was a former venue that the Fall League used to use. And it's now the home of Arizona State Baseball. And, you know, seeing the different contrast of we're going into the baseball palace downtown and then we're going into the humble roots of where the Fall League used to be for about 17 years. So it was really cool because you get a new perspective of the future of these guys and then the old history of where this league has been. And I think that was probably one of the more gratifying things of it it's funny i look back on which one was my favorite and i don't really know which one i would pick out of the two just because they were so special in their own right but it's fun to be able to continue to elevate the bar on top of this you know we've got a home run derby coming up a week from saturday and of course our fall stars game is going to be in the fold so there's all sorts of new changes that we've been able to put together it's amazing to see how much it's been able to grow just from last year into this year and you know, I don't know how we'll be able to top chase field but i'm hoping that's something that we'll keep doing for years to come that was that was really cool yeah, Phoenix is is the the hub uh, of of baseball in, in in so many ways. Obviously, we know spring training takes place down in Florida as well, but they got two coasts. I mean, there's there's hour long drives in between all of those things. But uh, to be able to to play at a, at a big league ballpark at, at Chase Field to to go at uh, any number of spring training facilities down there in the Phoenix area, and then also to be able to celebrate. Uh, the history of the Arizona Fall League uh, and and spring training facilities at Fe Phoenix Municipal Stadium, uh, and, and and even playing at ballparks like uh, Scottsdale Stadium, which is very historic and uh, doesn't doesn't feel historic like Wrigley Field historic, but you know it's from a, a bygone era. So you get a mix of all of that and just such a, a very small footprint. And look, when the temperature starts to get a little bit colder. Phoenix is very much uh, the place to be for all that. So um, you got ahead of me there talking about the All-Star game, which is going to be a uh, Fall Stars game, excuse me, which is going to be super exciting. One guy that you got to really like the odds of, of him getting in. And this is where we'll talk to about our Rockies guys. You do a great job uh, writing for a Purple Row uh, uh, and uh, and the show uh, you put on with uh, Kenneth Weber, our, our, our guest last week, talking about the prospects all the time. So I know you're the right guy to talk about it. You're looking at the guy this entire uh, autumn, uh, throughout the entire Arizona Fall League slate of games, Zach Veen, ninth overall pick in the 2020 MLB draft, first overall pick for the Rockies, taken out of high school. He's still only 20 years old. He's not even 21. We got to see him a little bit at Double A, and he was the, the the first player of the week there in the Arizona Fall League, and he has just been absolutely incredible what has been your take in getting to see this young man up close and personal you know i will put it this way if he doesn't make the fall stars game i should just turn in my credential at this point <laughs> like i mean he's an absolute lock for it in my opinion and i mean rightfully so it's been 
it's interesting to follow, especially just taking a look at his age and recognizing that, I mean, like you mentioned, 20 years old and something that, I mean, he went absolutely off in the first week and his stolen base attempts and successful stolen bases. I mean, it, it seems like he's a very mature player. And I think what stood out to me the most has been, you know, recognizing just the sheer plate discipline that he's able to handle himself with has been very cool. So there's been, you know, I guess part of my initial curiosity about him coming to the fall league is, you know, being 20 years old, what is the durability going to look like at this stage of, you know, it's, it's scary to think that he can even physically develop even more just being as young as he is at this point. So I remember thinking, you know, he was drafted in 2020. That was the COVID year. He had his senior year of high school cut short. He ended up, you know, it was a delayed minor league season in 2021. So 2022, this past year was really the first year that we got a chance to see him in a full minor league schedule. And that was kind of just the full slate that it's finally a chance that we get to see him on a full taste of a season. So my curiosity about him being sent to the fall league was, is this going to turn into, you know, maybe he burns himself out a little bit because that's a lot of workload just immediately off the heels of really not having a full season in the past two years. So to see him absolutely tear it up in week one was, I mean, very gratifying. And it made me realize, all right, he, this guy is as good as we really think he is. So that was, I mean, any like adverse concern that I had at that point, you know, I completely sold because every game I show up to, it seems like he hits at least two extra base hits at this point. But, you know, I think beyond this, and it's just really putting it into perspective of you have such, it's almost a disconnect from prospects. And this is part of the reason that I really like to, I mean, at least report on it myself is because there's always going to be something new that maybe you don't necessarily see because you're tied up covering the big league team or, you know, it's a whole lot easier to follow the Rockies just from accessibility alone. But I remember, you know, just the first time I saw him in person, I see his name on the back of the uniform and I'm just like, that's, that's the guy that was the DNVR draft day pod, the show that you guys did. That was the guy we were raving about. All of a sudden it was just, it was so real. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm shaking his hand. How are you? Good to see you. And it was just, seeing that there is a reality there and i know that's kind of a bare bones description but like this is an actual tangible like this is a skill set that we have the ability to see and i think that's part of what's really cool to showcase him in a platform like this so you know i say that in a long form to say this i believe that he is just as real as anybody wants to suggest that he is um i know there were some lofty comparisons to larry walker as soon as his name was put on the draft board which you know that's is, is that high that's definitely high i don't really have any reason to believe otherwise at this point, which perhaps that's an unfair comparison, but, you know, I'm definitely sold everything that I've seen. And on top of that, you know, he's a great dude to be around. He's a staple at the top of the Raptors batting order. And you know, I think that we're going to be taken care of for years to come, assuming that guy stays healthy and keeps staying the course. It's funny. You mentioned the, the comparisons to a guy like Larry Walker, because when Larry Walker was Zach Veen's age, he didn't know how to run the bases. He was, you know, the very famous story of basically cutting across the infield behind the, the pitcher's mound. I got to get back to first base. You still need to touch second on your way back yeah. to first base. So uh, it is amazing how those things kind of end up working out. Ethan uh, in our chat uh, asked, is, is he the, the prospect we should be most excited about? 100%. I, I think a lot of the uh, prospect rankings maybe had, you know, Ezekiel Tovar a notch ahead of Zach Veen. And again, a lot of that has to do with uh, the volatility of, of a player's uh, maybe swing and miss abilities or just projecting uh, a player. But as far as excitement goes, Zach Veen is incredibly exciting. Uh, he's got that swag, as you've uh, seen from the pictures with the mustache. Uh, he's got the, the long hair going in the back, the big shades. Uh, looks, it looks like a million bucks. And, you know, just, just by looking at the numbers, that'll tell you something as far as whether or not you should be excited about a player. Um, it might not tell you if the player is exciting in the way he plays, but it does make you excited. He's in 377 through 14 games that he's played. He has a homer, uh, nine RBIs, not a ton of homers are hit in this league, but the nine RBI uh, are a big thing. Uh, and to Justin's point here, 13 stolen bases, leads the, leads the AFL, has only been caught twice. But the excitement factor was completely on display last night because he was walked and uh, it happened to be a wild pitch on the walk and he got himself down to second base. So basically he's up there, pitcher's not giving him anything to hit and he ends up standing on second base as if he hit a double. That's the kind of player he is, busting his tail down the first baseline, sees an opportunity, goes in and sneaks into second base. This is the kind of wherewithal. He is very much um, 
a baseball rat, like, like a gym rat. He very much strikes me like an outfield speedier version of a Nolan Arenado. And uh, as we've been talking about in the last couple of weeks, I really think he's forcing the Rockies hand here and saying, Hey, I want to, I want to be on that team as soon as possible. I want to do it. The last Rockies prospect that was uh, an MVP in the Arizona Fall League, Nolan Arenado in 2012. We'll see if Zach Veen can do it here a decade later. But Zach, it's the it's the title of our show here. It's not as crazy as it would have even seemed <laughs> three weeks ago. Could Zach Veen be on the opening day roster for the Rockies next year? What's the percentage? It's not zero. <laughs> Three weeks ago, I think it was zero, right? You're like, hey, you got yeah. the double A, but come on, you, you relax. You know, he, he wasn't really that great in double A. Again, small sample size, uh, 34 games, decent amount, only hit 177. But what he's been able to do in the Arizona Fall League does make you think, well, it's greater than zero percent. <laughs> You know, it's interesting you say that too. And I was, I was thinking about this. I mean, I was at Scottsdale Stadium yesterday and seeing when he got to second base on a wild pitch. I'm just thinking, all right, this is not only is there some skill set, there's some awareness going on right here as well. So there was something. I mean, I think what I kind of gravitate to is seeing that Ezekiel Tovar didn't have. I, I'd say this tastefully. He didn't have the best season in the fall league last year, but it was also yeah. a huge jump that, I mean, it was almost unrealistic for him to have a great year just because, you know, the pitching is going to be more refined here. He was seeing, you know, a little bit more of the lower levels of the minors. And it, this, it really expedited his development once he really took off in the early stages of 2022. So my thought is, I think it's probably still under 50%, even if it be you start Veen in AAA, which I think is probably the realistic thing. I don't know if it would ever turn into a service time manipulation type of thing, which is another another side of the story. But what I'm curious about and what I'm perhaps the most excited for is recognizing that, you know, there's there's a need for what he can provide. And especially if you want to make a quick like jump in a hurry, as far as this is a guy that you've this is a guy that I believe you build a team around. And I think that especially with, you know, the up and coming crop that we have, as far as, you know, Tovar is going to be in the infield. Grant Levine is inevitably going to be there. I know Michael Tolley is also out, up there already. I'm thinking that if you really want to make a statement, if you want to show that this is our guy, and this is what the Tigers did with Spencer Torkelson last year. I mean, they put him on the opening day roster as well. I'm thinking in the event that that is, I mean, a statement move that especially, I mean, if you want to jumpstart a franchise that, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, a fifth place finish in the NL West, if you want to turn some heads right away, especially with, you know, you've got two teams and the Padres and the Dodgers within the division that, you know, right away, that's going to be very hard to have potential momentum with the amount of divisional games that are existing in April at this point. So it's not to say that Zach Veen can put an entire big lead team on his back right off the bat. However, I'm thinking, you know, just from the sheer degree of enthusiasm that could really come together, it's amazing to see what can serve just as a catalyst as far as, I mean, he has been just a human catalyst with the Raptors, what he's been able to put together, especially in the past week or two. And knowing that that has an opportunity to do it at the big league level, again, I don't know if that's fair. I mean, maybe that's a little too lofty at this point, but it makes me excited to recognize that there is something to speak for. And, you know, well, I do think that it's probably below 50%. I'm certainly rooting for the above, or I'm rooting for that contingency below 50%. But in the event that it does happen, I do think that there is some upside there. I think that he's proven to himself that he can handle higher level pitching in this league as well. And, you know, it definitely isn't zero. I agree with you there. I don't know if it's necessarily like projectable or if it would come together, but I think that we definitely got a shot. And if it's not coming in April, I think it's May or June might be a lot, a lot more decipherable. And that could be in the future here. Yeah, that that's interesting too. If it's not opening day, how soon is it after opening day? Uh, which which is getting sooner and sooner the the better and better he's playing and and hitting against these guys that are you know full two years older than him um, some even older than that we'll we'll get to the guys uh, with the Salt River Rafters representing the Rockies uh, that are all 25 years old or older so that gives you an idea of some of the competition uh, that Veen is is going against but I would I would set the the number at being on opening day very much under 50 percent I'm gonna say 15. Percent, which coincidentally, Justin, I don't know if you know this, 
as a member of the dnvr.com. You get 15% off your tab down in the corner of Colfax in York. Uh, you get extra raffle tickets at all of our watch parties, price breaks on any of our Broncos tailgates, uh, Nuggets party buses. If you're over in London right now and you're listening to a Rockies podcast, I've got some questions, but other than that, <laughs> you probably can get a price break on all the different things going on this entire week leading up to the big London game uh, with the Broncos going on there. Whether or not you might like the uniform choice that they've got going on, you're going to love what we're doing at the DNVR. So make sure you're a member. Only 50 cents for that mer- first month. Uh, and, of course, you get access to our members only Discord. Uh, and you also uh, get access to Breck Brew if you're down at the DNVR bar, where, again, it's 15% off even the drinks. It's fantastic. It's football season. so. Obviously, Mile High is is ready to get popping with the Broncos Country Pale Ale show off that colorful Colorado legacy with the Orange Crush logo and 100% Colorado ingredients in the Broncos Country Pale Ale. It's your go-to for football season. Check out the beer locator at breckbrew.com to find a Broncos Country Pale Ale near you. And as we said at the front, man, NBA is going on right now. The wait is over. Basketball is back. I think the Nuggets may have as many wins in this month of October as the Rockies have, which is still <laughs> mind blowing. Just three wins in October for the Rockies. It took for forever for the rest of the city of Denver to to get up to that three. So uh, I, I don't know what it means, but it's just a fact. I'm just putting that out there, like I'm putting out the fact that a five dollar bet on any NBA money line. Is going to get you $200 in free bets if you win with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Uh, you can also get those stepped-up same-game parlays. You can do that uh, at least uh, once per day. You get 100%. That's double. That's basically just a, an unfancy way of saying you double your winnings. You can't beat that. Uh, go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, opt-in, and place those same game stepped up parlays today make sure you're using code dnvr download the DraftKings sportsbook app now and use promo code dnvr make any five dollar nba money line bet this week and get two hundred dollars in free bets if your team wins only at DraftKings sportsbook with promo code dnvr minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply see show notes for details now uh you, you mentioned this young man who's second on the on the depth chart of of intriguing and enticing players for the Rockies down in the Arizona Fall League. That, of course, being first baseman Grant Levine, 23 years old. Uh, he's gotten him, uh, himself into 11 games, 15 for 40. I like that he's hitting 375, six doubles. So the power is going to come, has a triple uh, on his record, eight RBI right behind Zach Veen there. And um, besides an OPS north of 1,000, I love to see for these young guys a strikeout to walk rate that is that is almost one to one. He's walked six times, struck out only eight. Like to see that from Grant Levine. What have been your impressions uh, of this uh, bulky young man? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I say this in the most affectionate way possible. He looks like a 40-year-old dad that just has insane power. <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, when I was seeing him out there, I was like, the first time I, I ever like saw him in person, I mean, that was just over at Salt River Fields just a couple weeks ago. And you know, I, I say that hesitantly, but he's been in Hartford the whole time for the most part. So, I mean, that's quite the trip. But, you know, I remember seeing him out here and I'm like, oh, like this guy looks like Jason Giambi all of a sudden. Like this, this is legit. So, I mean, I know that might not be a fair comparison as well, but I mean, recognizing, I mean, seeing the swings that he puts together in batting practice, recognizing, I mean, we've got, of course, Vian and the speed that he has. It seems like a very prototypical guy that we can get used to as far as, you know, what we're looking for in the course field outfield, this could be huge. But at the same time, seeing somebody as far as what Grant Levine could do from a corner infield spot and the power that could really get put together in a venue like course field, I think it can do wonders for somebody. And that's, it gets me excited to recognize the instant like path to the big leagues that these guys could have or the instant role that you might end up seeing at the big league level. So, you know, you touched on it a little bit, the strikeout to walk ratio. He's played in 11 games. He's had, I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, about 40 at bats. He's got six walks on top of it. So I get, you know, yes, it is kind of a limited sample size in the fall league, but it's very cool to see somebody, especially with the double A experience that he has bringing a degree of plate discipline. And that's something that, you know, especially he's getting a good look on a lot of pitches that he really wants to swing at. It certainly seems that way. Or either that or he's just hitting everything, which, I mean, either one is a good sign. I guess you can't go wrong either way. But it's fun to see. And I guess something that I really like to look to, especially from double A hitters, after you make that jump into, 
you know, going from perhaps a little bit more inconsistent pitching in single A, all of a sudden you've got a little bit more consistent measures in the double A ranks. If this is how people are going to really go through the cycle and make some things happen, it makes me excited to recognize that, you know, he's taking that discipline, he's taking that perspective into where he inevitably is trying to go right now as far as that could be a big league setting where he's not going to see as many pitches as he otherwise would. Maybe the scouting report is a little bit thicker, but, you know, I'm, I'm fired up to recognize that there is a whole lot of upside for a guy like him. And, you know, it's deceiving to see just how much damage he truly can do, but, you know, you know same time i'm thinking you get a couple of them that could be a dangerous combination for a guy like him yeah he's a a guy that you know we haven't really discussed too much uh at least on our pod and and uh doesn't really get that much uh uh, discussed about uh, ultimately, uh, and I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that you know when he was taken forty uh, second overall uh, with a supplemental pick there in, in twenty eighteen, he, he very much just was a late bloomer. Like that's just the bottom line. And so we, we talk about with Zach Veen and the excitement and how he was, you know, he's hitting home runs at at Wrigley Field during the the perfect game home run derby. And so like, you know, there's certain guys that uh, they get put on that pedestal, and you know who they are. I mean, shoot, Bryce Harper, everyone knows, you know, was on the cover of Sports Illustrated at 16 years old. He was even mentioned in uh, New York Times, I think, at age 13. So, like, those guys, you're going to keep an eye on them. And even if they have a, a month-long lull or, or a stretch of, of bad play, you go, that's okay. I'm still excited by that guy. With Grant Levine, you know, he's he's the highest position player ever taken out of the state of New Hampshire, which – you know, again, it isn't a place that churns out a ton of uh, big league players. And so he's had to really prove, uh, you know, along the way. And I think there are, are some of those growing pains when you're playing up in the Northeast, uh, in, in, you know, New Hampshire, Vermont, and places like that, where maybe the competition level wasn't that good. And so, you know, he, uh, he hit the ground there um, really hard, I think. Uh, and that, that can be difficult for a lot of young guys, but he's obviously bounced back. Uh, and as you say, you know, you, you like a lot what you're seeing there. Another corner infield guy. So uh, we could have ourselves a log jam, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. If the Rockies front office can, you know, manage uh, those kind of players and maybe work out a deal and say, hey, we've got, a, we've got some strength over here between third base and first base and maybe even to a degree second base. Let's see if we could swing a deal uh, to acquire some more pitching or something else that we need. So uh, it's good to see Levine having that success. Warming Ber Bernabel, I can't say it's a similar story with uh, being a late bloomer because he's one of those guys, international players, who, of course, was was signed so young as a teenager, but he's 21 years old now, struggling a little bit uh, this season, does have a homer for RBI, but he's putting the ball in play, uh, only six strikeouts in 39 walks. Uh, Justin, what have you seen out of uh, warming Bernabel, who uh, did get a taste of high A Spokane after uh, being one of the, the big players there in Fresno to help them win the California League? Has the defense been holding up? Uh, what do you like out of his bat? What have you seen from warming Bernabel so far this uh, October? Sure. You know, it's been, I mean, as you mentioned, it hasn't necessarily been a great showing at the plate, but I don't necessarily think that's as bad of a thing as we might at least expect for it to be, especially how great of a season that he did have in the minor leagues. It's interesting to, I mean, there's a little bit of a delay. You pause itself and then you reset itself back up in October into November as well. So I think that, you know, he's facing more refined pitching here. And I mean, that's part of why I'm definitely high on the Grant Levine train as far as what he's been able to do, uh, just getting used to, I mean, more refined arms, more, as we mentioned, you know, the scouting report gets a little bit different the higher up you get through the ranks. So I think that Bernabel is seeing less mistakes from pitchers as he might otherwise have taken a, have taken a look at in the single A levels, but also recognizing that, you know, getting used to it and the adaptation phase of, at least getting accustomed to what you're going to see moving forward. I think that's something that, you know, I look back on what Ezekiel Tovar did. He didn't have the greatest fall league, but it turned into a tremendous double A AA and triple A campaign that inevitably got him to the big leagues this past year. So I think that, you know, yes, that might be a lofty comparison as well. And I don't think that Bernabel will have that much of an expedited path as Tovar does just because, you know, he doesn't have the amount of experience, I suppose, that Tovar had going in, but, you know, at the same time, recognizing just a year ago, he was dealing with low A and a whole lot of complex league work. And now all of a sudden we put into the fold just how quickly we've been able to see him push forward. And something that I kind of think of is I know we had 
Willie MacGyver, a catcher last year in the fall league, we put him through, I, I say we as if I'm part of the organization, but we put him through high A, double A, triple A, and the fall league. And I mean, it was a huge, like, I mean, it was a rapid fire. We're going to see, we're going to throw him into the fire and see what he can do. So I think of this, you know, maybe it's not a direct comparison, but it's an opportunity for him to really refine his eyes to what he's going to be looking for moving forward. So I think that, you know, perhaps it's an unrealistic expectation to expect that he's going to do extremely well in the fall league. And, you know, that's not to be a knock on who he is as a player or anything of that nature. But, you know, I think that we're going to see the reward of him being down here paying off down the road as far as, you know, when it gets to the double A AA and triple A consistent work that, you know, he'll inevitably receive on the path that he is. I think that this is a huge learning opportunity for him. And it might be, I mean, as we're seeing here, it is a little bit of a struggle, but I don't think that's a completely bad thing. So, you know, hopefully this is going to turn into some good senses. I think that, you know, especially in a place like Coors Field where you can do a lot of damage on a lot of pitching mistakes, that's something that, you know, you're not going to be able to execute pitches as well in the altitude as you are in other ballparks. And, you know, I keep going back to these big league comparisons, which, I mean, if that's the way it is, if that's the nature that we're going to be working with, I think that it's going to pan out to be a good sign. So, you know, I'm speaking from my own pitching experience. I hung too many breaking balls in Denver to get away with them all the time. But recognizing that, you know, if that is truly the course of action for warming Bernabell in the big league ranks, if that's the kind of guy that we can get used to. He certainly shows all the tangibles that you would be looking for. And as soon as that pitch selection comes together, I'm thinking that could be a pretty dangerous combination. And I'm certainly fired up. For sure. Yeah. Even with his promotion to uh, Spokane, he still was able to hit over 300. So uh, hasn't, you know, uh, had, had too many uh, difficulties and too many uh, challenges. Generally speaking, if you're, if you're just looking at the numbers uh, over the course of his career. So uh, I think this, this kind of struggling, uh, as you mentioned, you know, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. You want to challenge these guys, see how they respond to it. Uh, we also know that that coming up here uh, in just a couple of weeks, the Rockies will be adding some players uh, to the 40 man roster in order to protect them from uh, being selected in the rule five draft. Uh, Zach Veen does not need to be put on the 40 man just yet. So if you don't hear his name uh, in a couple of weeks, that's why um, if, if they, they want to put him on the opening day roster, that's something that they'll take care of in March uh, as we get closer to the season. But Levine and Bernabelle are two of those players who, need to be protected uh, or else they could be uh, left exposed to the rule five draft. Do you think it's, it's pretty much a, a slam dunk, even regardless of performance, even if a guy like Bernabelle doesn't get back on track or if Levine, you know, starts to struggle here uh, over the final couple weeks of the Arizona fall league, seems like a slam dunk. You think these two guys will be on the 40 man here in a couple weeks? You know, that's, that's an excellent question. First and foremost, I think that, you know, it's, I believe this is a, I, I know from other organizations that Arizona Fall League serves as an opportunity to whether or not you want to put the stock into those players. I mean, it's a final look of, of you know, this is a testing ground that people look at. So I think that, you know, Levine at the current pace that he is, I feel like that is a virtual lock at this point, and especially just realizing the minor league course of action that they've put together for him. And I mean, the levels that he's been at, and I don't think you want to jeopardize a bat like him. That's very much tailored for Coors Field. I think that, you know, putting Bernabelle in the position that he is in, and this is something that, you know, not so much of my own perspective, but just kind of a knowledge of how some organizations treat the fall league. I think that there could be a potential that, you know, maybe his struggles in the fall league, if they put him down here to see whether or not he should or shouldn't be a 40 man guy, it's tough to really recognize what the motive is. You know, I'll personally be a little sad because I love watching him play, but I'm thinking it could be the kind of case. And, you know, it's not to say even if somebody is available for a potential rule five selection, that's not to say they are going to be selected because that requires, you know, another organization has the room for them at the big league level or they got to return them and there's all sorts of other other tricky details that go into it i suppose but you know i think that recognizing somebody with the potential that both of them have if there is an opportunity for them and i think historically the way the rockies have kind of generally favored the fall league i, I believe this was what willie mciver was in the fall league last year before it was be able to get a look and see if he was going to be one of these guys so if that is the case, and I suppose that easily could be, I'm thinking the only reason that Bernabelle might not be a 40-man guy is maybe based on the Rockies wanting to get a final look here to see whether or not he's really expedited to get to where they need to be. So, 
you know, I think that that might be the slight aversion to it. I also think that it might be, you know, maybe dismissive to just disregard all of the minor league body of work that he put together this year as well. And it's perhaps unfair to say, you know, all of a sudden we're going into October and November and these guys are really young. Like this is a very long season on top of a fall league that, you know, maybe there is a little bit of burnout going on at this point. And, you know, for guys that are making routine habits out of extra base hits, maybe those are turning into some flyouts because you're starting to experience some fatigue or you're starting to have your body catch up to you, which I think anybody could understand after the length of the season that these guys are going through. So I'm curious to follow it. I think that there definitely is an opportunity for both of them to get there. I'm selfishly hoping that there is because, you know, they've been a lot of fun to watch down here. But I think that is, I know that's that's probably a long and drawn out way of saying I don't exactly know, but I think that that's probably a safe bet. And, you know, if the two of them are on the 40-man roster, I would definitely understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that uh, playing out for, for them. Uh, almost similar to what you know we saw last year, uh, as you mentioned, Willie McIver, uh, part of the uh, Salt River Rafters in, in 2021, did not get placed on the 40-man. I was a little bit surprised by that because I thought uh, he very much could be a guy that could contribute uh, at the big league level, and some teams would like what he's able to do defensively. Didn't happen, so to your point again, just because a guy is uh, exposed or left available to that doesn't mean he's going to be taken. Uh, but Tovar and Tolia were, were two guys that were down last year. Uh, they were uh, placed on the 40 man. They did debut. And then a guy like Jake bird very much overlooked, uh, despite having really good numbers uh, last year at both Hartford uh, and triple a uh, Albuquerque did not get put on the 40 man. No one picked him up. Uh, and he was still able to uh, debut and uh, pitch in, uh, I want to say, like 42 in a third innings uh, this year. So he was uh, very valuable to them. Reagan Todd was also a part of the club last year. And then you had uh, Jordan Sheffield and Ryan Vallade, who both had debuted and played with the Rockies during the season. Kind of a, uh, a strange wrinkle there that uh, we're also seeing right now with a guy like Peter Lambert, who's already on the 40 man, but bouncing back from injuries right now he's a very interesting guy that's been uh, discussed a lot with manager bud black uh, as far as the plans for the future for the rockies uh, and and i want to discuss uh how, how he's been able to do especially after his first two outings uh which we definitely want to forget but uh the one thing we we need to tell you about and you don't want to forget is game time tickets because that's the thing that uh, whether or not uh, you're hanging out in the dugout with bud black or you're going down to the arizona fall league uh, to watch games that's what's going to allow you to find a seat at the 50 yard line or courtside or behind home plate. In this instance, with the Game Time app, uh, there's a link in our description, whether it's a podcast or if you're watching live or you're getting the recap later on after the fact. If you want to see all of our wonderful graphics and say, what is this? Uh, what does this gent Justin Wick look like? That's what the DNVR Sports Channel on YouTube is going to be all about. I've been using Game Time tickets for a very long time, for, for close to a decade here. So I went to my first show at Red Rocks. I got. 15 bucks to get in. It was fun, period. F U N, period. All right. I think that's, I think they have a period uh, in their name. Uh, and Tegan and Sarah, I actually just went for Tegan and Sarah, but I, I got tickets right up until the, the concert was about to start. So it was fantastic. 15 bucks for two tickets to get in to Red Rocks. Those are the kind of deals you can, uh, you can get from game time tickets. Save up to 60% when you wait closer to that first pitch or the start of the event. Again, use the link in our description to help save. And you're also going to save 20% off when you use code DNVR20 at HassleCattleCompany.com, H-A-S-S-E-L-L, CattleCompany.com. We feature them at our tailgates. Uh, plenty of chefs uh, that are at home that that fancy themselves as, as someone who likes to uh, cook on a budget, and but you want to do it affordably, obviously, and you want it to still be top shelf. Well, that's where Hassle Cattle Company Wagyu Beef is going to come in there because it can be shipped absolutely anywhere. Uh, it's HassleCattleCompany.com using code DNVR20 for 20% off. So Peter Lambert uh, did struggle his first two outings with the Salt River Rafters. Again, this is just about him extending his season because uh, it was really limited uh, in uh, very much a major way. Uh, but his last two outings have been really solid. His previous start, three innings pitch, did not give up a hit, uh, no walks, and five strikeouts on 35 pitches. Someone told me he pitched last night, but I, I'm not sure if that's true or not, Justin. Uh, what have been your impressions of, of Peter Lambert? We kind of know what he's been at the major league level, really health-wise. You know, is is he able to kind of get back to to where maybe he once was? 
You know, it's it's funny because I've thought as far as what is the motive of putting him in the fall league. And I think that this is pretty much just a gratified spring training for him as far as we already know the tangible deals that he has. He debuted in the big leagues in 2019 and he already made a ton of starts. So I think that there is there's an opportunity for him to, I mean, certainly develop that. I mean, this is a developmental league, but there's not really, I mean, we already know what he has because we've already seen him in so many big league settings at this point. So I think that, you know, you can't really look at the results itself and what he's doing in the fall league. You need to look more like particularly as far as just the actual tools that he's showing. And I know that, you know, with you don't exactly have the pitch data available for these games as you would in the big league settings that he's already pitched in, but, you know, recognizing that's probably the primary reason that he's here and, you know, it's not so much working yourself out of jams on the pitcher's mound. It's a little bit more of, you know, getting your work in and executing to doing what you need to do. So, I mean, everything that I've seen, it seems like, you know, definitely fighting back from the elbow issues that he's had previously. He had Tommy John surgery in 2020, and he's been slowed a little bit as far as, you know, somebody that the Rockies certainly were banking on to be kind of a staple in the rotation at this point in time. You know, you take a hit to him and then you take a hit to Ryan Rollison missing the entire year this past year. And, it certainly changed it in a hurry. I mean, that's a, that's another wormhole of a discussion that we can dive through. But, you know, it's been fun to see him definitely getting the work down here and recognizing that, you know, for the same reasons that it's fun to see Zach Veen and some of these other players that you maybe haven't seen for a while or you're maybe trying to build a familiarity with, you're kind of regaining a familiarity for somebody that you may have seen a couple of years ago. And, I mean, it seems like ages ago now that, you know, we're one pandemic later and we haven't exactly seen him in the big leagues for a while. but. <laughs> You know, for him being one of the older players in the fall league, I feel like that also kind of prioritizes that, you know, he's treating this a little bit different than any other kind of pitcher that might otherwise be in his shoes. You know, he's 25 years old, which is, for the most part, well older than, if I'm not mistaken, he might be one of the five oldest players in the fall league. And that's not a knock on him. It's just, you know, it's a window of this is where you can get your developmental time. And this is where you can fight back and certainly get used to being on a mound again. So it's it's tough because I don't want to just separate the result exactly, but also recognizing that he's also here for different motives than a lot of other guys. I think that, you know, the priority is first and foremost, is the elbow feeling well? And I mean, at this point in time, everything that suggests, you know, him staying on course with the starts that he's had and getting routine work, it seems like that alone is a good sign. And, you know, it's going to be very much as far as what can he do to prepare himself for March to where he's inevitably going to be. So I think that it's fun to follow. It's fun to recognize that, you know, this is a familiar face that Rockies fans have actually seen on their TV sets at this point in time. But, you know, I'm excited to follow it through. And I'm thinking especially, you know, assuming that he's able to stay healthy, which, you know, everything looks good at this point in time. It's fun to recognize that we have a little bit of a surplus of pitching all of a sudden, you know, after a little bit of transitions and some unhealthy issues and, you know, some roster moves, there might be a little bit of breathing room as far as what we're looking for in the big league rotation. and. You know, similar to warming Bernabel, if this is just an opportunity for him to you know, develop his eyes and be able to see pitches better, this could be a chance just for Peter Lambert to be able to feel more comfortable on the mound, regain his footing and get back to the guy that we've certainly touted for quite some time. So if that is all this fall league pans out to be for him, you know, I think that'll be a pretty good sign. Yeah, have you gotten a uh, as a as a fellow reliever yourself? There, have you gotten a, a chance to to see as any of the Rockies relievers? impressed you at all obviously what Phineas Del Bonta Smith did last night two and two thirds innings pitched was right. really nice uh Stephen Jones and then Blair Calvo all those guys 25 uh, Blair Calvo 26 uh you know struggled again it, it, small sample size it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh much of anything but as is there one guy that has impressed you the most from that group and say hey you know what maybe this could be a guy uh, that, you know, injuries are going to happen. We know that. Uh, but with a good AAA season in 2023, we could see at Coors Field at some point next year. You know, I'm, I'm very biased, first of all. I mean, I, I got a little storyline behind this one. So Finn Del Bonta Smith is a former teammate of mine, believe it or not. He actually took a closer spot from me back in the day. <laughs> but I say North took it. He deserved it. I mean, this was in the Northwoods League, yes. So he played for San Jose State. And at the time, I was going to school at Creighton. And we met, I think it would have been about four years ago. And he had, I believe his ERA was a 0 0.68 in the Northwoods League. And just, I mean, he absolutely he dominated. It was incredible. And I mean, what, probably one of the more consistent arms that I remember seeing over the course of, I mean, a set body of work. So I say this, I mean, I have inherent bias toward 
my guy Finn just because, you know, that's that's the way it goes, of course. But, you know, seeing the pitch mix that he does have, and I know he was somebody that I was, I hate to say I was surprised when he was named to the roster. I mean, kind of in a similar capacity to Reagan Todd last year. It was somebody that maybe you didn't really think was going to be here, but, you know, in a reliever position and, you know, somebody that has an opportunity to show off their consistency that they had shown the previous year. He's been somebody that I've taken note for and he actually made a start last night, which was something that I was starting to kind of get caught up on going, this is, I mean, he carved his way through working into a third inning of work. And I mean, he looked very consistent as far as, you know, nobody's really getting a good swing off of anything that he's putting in play or putting over the plate at this point. So it's been, it, it's been fun to get accustomed to. He did walk a couple guys last night, but at the same time, you know, he's getting used to the first inning for the first time and whoever knows how long, but you know, recognizing what is the priority for somebody like him. And, you know, he's proven that he could potentially go to work as a long reliever or a short reliever. And there's a lot of flexibility for a guy like him. So I believe that, I mean, there is some upside along the same capacity of, you know, maybe you expedite his path to double A AA or triple A, kind of like what the Rockies did with Reagan Todd one year removed. It seems like that, that might be kind of a cop out of a comparison because it's just a one year disconnect at this point. But you know, all of my bias aside, I think that he definitely stands out as a guy that could get some recognized ability for what he's able to do. And, you know, from the body frame that he has to the pitches that he's able to execute, you know, not only is he one of the hardest working dudes that I know, which I know that's a little selfish insider perspective, but, you know, seeing what he's been able to put together on that and just seeing the consistency that he treats his work with every single day, this was someone that you know, in my own career, I was inspired to be more like him just because of the way that he handled himself. And, you know, it certainly helped when every time that I was in uniform with him, he absolutely dominated, of course. <laughs> but seeing that, you know, he still has that exact same drive. He still has that same commitment. That's something that, you know, I can imagine as an organization, you revere that in your player. And that could have certainly earned him a fall week invite. So, you know, it's the kind of guy that you definitely want to pull for. I've seen it. I mean, even just now as cashing in my uniform for a polo shirt, you know, some things never change and it's that kid's commitment to what he does. So very excited to follow that. You know, that's not a knock on Stephen Jones or Blair Calvo as well. I felt like, you know, their mixes as well, kind of in a similar perspective, but, you know, seeing all three come together and then, you know, having a little bit of a personal tie to one of them, you know, I've got some affinity for that Raptors bullpen at this point, but I think any three of them have a pretty good chance to continue to push forward. Yeah, Justin, you know, if, if uh, Phineas, you know, happens to, you know, get a couple of saves with the Rockies in the next couple of years and, and serve as their closer, that does not mean because you were his setup man before you will have that opportunity again. I'm sorry. That does not, it's not how this works, but I tell you what, how it does work as far as fans go. Uh, if he even has a modicum of success, people will, he will have somewhat of a buzz. He will have a fan following with the name Phineas. <laughs> El Bonta Smith. That's right. That is just that. That's a money maker right there. <laughs> we, we talked at the beginning of the show here, obviously, about uh, how much the AFL is is a money maker for these young guys and and preparing them for the big leaguers. Went back and looked. There were fifty six players. You might even have the exact number if I'm off by one or two, but fifty six players who made their major league debut this year who is in last year's group. Uh, that, of course, in many ways, I think being headlined. Um, by two shortstops now that are playing the World Series, Bryson Stott, Jeremy Pena, uh, who were there for uh, the Phillies uh, and Astros. And St. Louis had four guys, Juan Yepes, Lars Nootbaar, Brendan Donovan, uh, who, who's a finalist for a gold glove, Nolan Gorman. They were all there. You had players like uh, Logan Ohapi, who was uh, in, involved in the Noah Syndergaard deal, who's playing here in the World Series. Mackenzie Gore was part of the Juan Soto, Josh Beltre. So, like, that is the caliber of player that is in the Arizona Fall League and, and just how quickly they can transition and, and debut in the big leagues, despite some of them being only 20, 21, 22 years old. Who's been uh, – give me two names – that you've got at the top of your list as far as prospects go that are playing right now in the Arizona Fall League? Sure. You know, it's it's funny to me. I, I would probably say Bryson Stott as far – and I'd say this more because it, it just shocks me that, you know, I saw him at such a grassroots level last year of, like, helping coordinate interviews that involved him and seeing him on the field and saying hi, and now he's on TV in front of all of these people, and it's like – that's part of the reason I love the fall league is because this is your final attempt to really see these people in a very grassroots level of baseball where it's, I mean, extreme intimate environments with an even more intimate crowd. 
it's just it, it's so weird seeing this and this is a guy i mean it's i know that doesn't say much as far as like analysts or analysis at that point but you know seeing that he's been a contributor to the extent that he has and recognizing that you know especially picking up the experience that he has catching with a hot team now in the world series and you know, i think of it as far as you know the dodgers with julio urias as far as what that experience does for him you know at such a young age now he's not necessarily shocked by the big stage it's just business as usual i think that alone and especially when the phillies have just taken fire and maybe not been exactly a pick to be in the world series now all of a sudden this is a guy that not only has helped them get there and been a staple in their lineup but is also picking up you know very invaluable experience with now i imagine if you're in this part of a roller coaster ride in your rookie season that probably does very well for your maturity moving forward so i would say if i had to pick two i would put him in the mix just more from the fact that he's been able to be such a contributor and that's a dangerous combination of, you know, the learning development that he picked up in the fall league, it's only continuing now on the biggest stage that exists. So I would put him in there. I'm thinking looking around as far as the other recognition for what has gone on, Mackenzie Gore made a couple of starts in the fall league last year. We didn't see a whole lot out of him, but then recognizing, you know, you put him in a package deal with another guy, Robert Hassel the third that we're seeing in the fall league right now as well. Seeing that, you know, the Nationals are really selling the ship to be able to secure, well, I'm sorry, the Padres selling the ship to land Juan Soto. I thought that, you know, recognizing a figurehead along the lines of the last time that I really remember a good Nationals, or I, I say good, not that they're bad, but, you know, the marquee, the paramount headlining dude would have been Steven Strasburg. And this is seeing that you know you're banking on another starting pitcher yes they have a lot more people that are in the fold but Mackenzie gore is arguably the most big league ready one that they were able to secure and the amount of buzz that existed around him last year you know it's a name that yes when juan soto is involved in a trade you recognize in a hurry that maybe you know the other names aren't going to get the headlining news but it's something that, you know, if you're definitely prospect savvy, you can recognize that this is, again, building a franchise around somebody. This could be an opportunity to do that as well. You know, understood it wasn't just him in there because it's going to take a lot more to land Juan Soto if you're the Padres. But I think that those two are probably a pretty safe pick. Bryson Stott and what Mackenzie Gore has been able to put together. I think that, you know, those are two dudes that you realistically could build your team around. And that's something that I think that we could see moving forward. So, I say that to say this, any one of those Cardinals guys, I think there's like seven alumni that debuted in 2022 that used to be fall leaguers. So realizing that the Cardinals treat the fall league a little bit differently as far as just sending their absolute dudes, I think you could pick any, any of those out of the fold. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you a, a modified answer. I'll go Stott, I'll go Gore, and I will go the entire St. Louis Cardinals contingency. It does make you think, you know, what guys could be traded next off or not next off season, next trade, you know, deadline day. Um, are, are there, again, there's no way of, of knowing who's going to be buyers, who's going to be sellers of the 2022 crop right now in the Arizona fall league, who are some of the names that uh, people should be looking out for? Cause you know, if they don't debut next year, uh, they'll de be debuting in the near future. And, and, and they are very much going to be uh, an integral part of the next generation of superstars. Who are those guys right now that you are, uh, you're watching uh, this October? Sure. You know, it's been, it's, it's funny too. I mean, I just mentioned the Cardinals. They have yet again sent a lot of their dudes. I mean, players, Jordan Walker is the, I believe he's the sixth ranked prospect in baseball that he's playing for the Raptors as well. So yeah, all the more reason to follow the Rockies and the Fall League. You can take a look at those guys. Um, seeing what he's been able to do as well as, you know, there's some other guys, a reliever named Tink Hentz for the Padre, for the Cardinals, excuse me. He's been able to, he's got an electric pitch, like a mix of pitches. And he's somebody that, you know, the body frame that he has with the power that he's able to put together off the mound, he's a really fun dude to be able to watch. So looking around, I know there's two hitters for the Oakland A's. Denzel Clark is one of them and Lawrence Butler is another one, which especially recognizing, you know, maybe this isn't going to be able to get them to, you know, for like premacy in the American League West, because that's a tough division to break through. But you know, realizing that, you know, the organizational depth for those guys and those two could very well be at the top of the big league lineup over in Oakland this next year. Those have been two that have been a lot of fun to be able to watch and fun to put together. Heston Kerstad is my guy, personally. I mean, I know that that kind of goes against my Rockies ties, but he's with Baltimore and he played at the University of Arkansas, made it to the College World Series 
probably 20 times in four years, just because that's what they do in Arkansas. <laughs> but seeing what he has done, he's currently the fall league leader in home runs. I believe he has five of them at this point. And, you know, one of them inside the Parker, he's been showing off plenty of speed on top of this and just very much, you know, an all around five tool player from what I have seen. And it shows, I mean, he was the second overall pick in the draft and, you know, I remember it was, it's funny you kind of put this in this context. I mentioned the draft show that DNVR did in 2020. Looking at the draft board that year, of course, the Rockies were picking in the top 10, and it seemed like a long shot that Zach Veen was even going to drop to where the Rockies were in that selection. And I was thinking Heston Kirstad was potentially going to come to Colorado if that was indeed, you know, the outfield move that they were going to try to make. So, I remember I was thinking maybe it's going to be Max Meyer or Reed Detmers as a pitching prospect that the Rockies were going to select. Max Meyer ends up getting taken third to the Marlins. Kerstad gets taken second to the Orioles. And I just, you guys were on the show, and you were like, what are we going to do now? This entire board just flipped over. The guys that we thought were going nine are going second and third. So it's fun to see this and kind of, you know, especially after doing the homework on him before he was even a pro player. And I think that's kind of the cool perspective of following prospects and now seeing it through to the fall league. You know, again, kind of a little bit of an inherent bias. And, you know, thank you guys for making me do my homework for that draft show, because that's now fueling into what we see today in the fall league. But, you know, I would say he's probably the one that I've really enjoyed watching the most. Somebody that's really, well, Zach V in the side, I suppose, <laughs> but I think that Kerstad's been somebody that could really put some stuff together. And, you know, again, kind of the concept of who do you build a franchise around? He seems like a guy that can definitely do it. You pair him with Adley Rutschman out in Baltimore, and, you know, that could be a pretty dangerous combination. So, you know, I say that to also say there's a lot of dudes that are down here that have been a lot of fun to watch. And even some of the lesser touted players that, you know, can really make a name for themselves or break out down here, you know, that's not to overlook them. But, you know, I do have a little bit of a bias and i will say heston kerstad is my guy and he's a really good dude as well so that, that's where i'm at at this point and and you know if there's not a better reason to go down to the arizona fall league just to learn how to spell these players names heston <laughs> i think people i think 95 percent of the public is going to spell that right but it's the kerstad i think that could trip <laughs> up a lot of people so i mean uh, if you're big on the spelling Go down to the Arizona Fall League. Say hi to Justin. You can reach out to him uh, on Twitter at Just Wick. Justin, love having you on. Love to have you on uh, again, maybe at some point this offseason to to discuss are the Rockies going to actually do something? Uh, you know, <laughs> hey, we're not in control of those things. They don't listen to us necessarily. Uh, but if that does happen, if something does go down, uh, you know, we can talk about. You know, Justin's going to be writing about it on on Purple Row, discussing it on Twitter. Uh, making those night moves. Uh, love all that stuff. Follow us on Twitter at DNVR underscore Rockies at Patrick D Lyons is where I'm at. This has been wonderful, but, but you know what they say about momentum. It's only as good as your next show. So we will talk to you tomorrow in studio Thursday at 11 a.m.